Yes, he's right there. Yes, we did. Sorry. You Mr. Thompson? Yes, I am. Sorry. <laughs> Session, the Honorable Chief Judge Von Walker presiding. Thank you. You may be seated. Very well. Good morning, Council. Uh, let me ask that you enter your appearances this morning by simply signing in with the clerk, and she will provide that to uh, the court reporter. So all who wish to enter an appearance can have that recorded without the necessity of us uh, going through the, the litany that we have during these proceedings. Now, um, one other point. Uh, is Ms. Pachter the Attorney General's... Uh, I beg your pardon? All right. Well, I have entered an order this morning asking and setting a deadline for a response to the question that I asked her yesterday of 5 p.m. on Thursday, and then would ask the proponents and the plaintiffs uh, to respond with whatever position they have on that question, whether it has some bearing on the issue of standing that we discussed on Wednesday. I'm not sure, but uh, at least that's a thought rolling around in the back of my mind, and with your able assistance, I'd like to be able to sort through that question. All right. I believe we're ready to continue the testimony of Ms. Cott. That's correct. Very well. Would you um, bring her forward? And as you do so, as you come to the stand, Ms. Cott, let me remind you you're still under oath. Understand that? Yes, Your Honor. All right, fine. The oath, the oath that you took yesterday applies to this testimony as it did yesterday. You may proceed, Mr. Boutrous. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Professor Cott. Good morning, Mr. Boutrous. Your Honor, before I proceed with the examination on uh, one exhibit issue, I have conferred with Mr. Thompson, and um, the proponents do not have any objections to the, the, the select group of exhibits that were relied upon by Professor Cott in her testimony, so I would move that they be admitted into evidence. Let's see, those are exhibit numbers. Um, I could list them off for the court if that would be helpful. In fact, I have a list. All right, why don't you just hand that list up to yes. uh, the court clerk and we'll take care of it. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I would like to publish to the screen another demonstrative that I created out of the transcript of Mr. Cooper's opening. And I've, I've labeled it um, Proponent's Position 2. Publish that, please. Professor Cott, I have um, displayed on the screen one of Mr. Cooper's statements yesterday about the purpose of marriage. And I will read it for the record. 
Mr. Cooper said that the purpose of the institution of marriage, the central purpose, is to promote procreation and to channel naturally proc procreative sexual activity between men and women into stable and enduring unions. It is the central and we would submit defining purpose of marriage. In your work as a historian, have you examined the purposes of marriage in the United States? Yes. Could you give me your views as an expert in the history of marriage in the United States as to uh, that statement that by Mr. Cooper in his opening statement? I could. Would you do that for me? Let me begin by saying when I'm speaking of the purposes, I mean from the point of view of the state that sets up and defines the terms of marriage. And as I look at the history of the institution in our country, I would certainly agree that this is one of the purposes, but it is by no means the central or the defining purpose of marriage. In, in fact, picking this out, rather, uh, when I heard it yesterday, it rather reminded me of the story about the seven blind men and the elephant in that each of them is feeling the animal at some side of it, and the one that feels the trunk says, oh, this animal is just like a snake. That is, marriage has many purposes. It is, as I mentioned yesterday, a capacious, complex institution, and uh, the state's interest in having sexual activity between men and women channeled into stable unions is one of the purposes of marriage. But I think that the larger understanding of marriage from the state's point of view and the larger purpose would put an emphasis on the household formation that marriage um, founds and the stability of that household formation, its contribution to social order, to economic benefit, to governance. And I emphasize this because, as I said at the outside, it's important to recognize the extent to which marriage has been an institution of governance in our history. Let, well, me, what let me ask you about, about that. Um, it, it, when you say governance, how, how is marriage uh, an instrument of governance when it's a, a union between two people? How does that contribute to governance? Looking at this historically, what I'm emphasizing here and using that word is the uh, regulatory purpose of marriage from the state's point of view. And uh, long ago, marriage had an important political governance purpose. It set up uh, men as heads of households who, who would be responsible economically for their spouses and for any of their dependents, whether those were biological children, adopted children, stepchildren, slaves, apprentices, etc. But the point of es establishing marriage and giving certain uh, benefits to it was to ensure that the sovereign would be able to govern the, the amorphous, large, variable population in smaller subunits, which were households. Now, that political governance purpose of marriage today is, uh, has shifted rather dramatically because we no longer assume that a single head of household governs everyone below it. We have a much more individualized uh, um, distribution of political power in our population, particularly since 1920 when women got the right to vote. However, the, it, still today, the purpose of the state in licensing and incentivizing marriage is to create stable households in which the adults who reside there and are committed to one another by their own consent will support one another as well as their dependents. The institution of marriage has always been at least as much about supporting adults as it has been about supporting um, minors, uh, children, as um, the, um, the proponents tend to emphasize the child side. Has the ability or willingness to procreate ever been a, a litmus test or a test of any kind in terms of the validity of a marriage in the United States during our history? 
Bell. And has, as a historical matter, have there been, has it been recognized that there are other benefits aside from child-rearing benefits from marriage? Most definitely from the point of view of the state as well as the point of view of the individuals who join it. There has never been a requirement that a couple produce children in order to have a valid marriage. Of course, people beyond procreative age have always been allowed to marry. And known sterility or barrenness in a woman has never been a reason not to allow a marriage. In fact, it's a surprise to many people to learn that George Washington, who's often called the father of our country, was sterile and was known to be sterile because he was in a second marriage to a woman who had had children. And after George Washington and she married, they had no children. This was an advantage in many people's minds because he couldn't establish a hereditary monarchy when he became president. But this is just a rather striking example of the extent to which procreative ability has never been a qualification for marriage, nor has it been a ground, the lack of the same has never been a ground for divorce. Now, as a historical matter, has there been a function of marriage, a purpose of marriage, in terms of legitimating children? Yes. This function is not at all as vigorous as it used to be in the longer past when there was a much stricter line of moral judgment between heterosexual couples who were married and those who were not married if they were engaging in sexual activity. Certainly, the line between legitimacy and illegitimacy for any child born of a heterosexual couple was the line of marriage, non-marriage. And that was a very important function, particularly among the property because of lines of inheritance that would flow through legitimate children and only problematically or much less so through so-called illegitimate children. Now, today, in the 20th century, the tendency has been to remove that bright line in terms of the child's just desserts. However, I believe it is still true in our family courts that the marital family's children has the presumption of all benefits that should flow to children, whereas the unmarried couple's children has to prove that they deserve these inheritance rights and other benefits of their parents. Yesterday, you spoke about the social meaning of marriage. Does the legitimating factor in a broader sense have any connection to the social meaning of marriage as it's developed in our history? Yes. Could you describe in what way? I think I would just say that the fact that the state is involved in granting these kinds of benefits and legitimacy to the marital family tends to lend a prestige, a status to that institution that no informal marriage has ever approximated. I would like to, Your Honor, display what I've labeled Proponent's Position 3, which is another statement taken from Mr. Cooper's opening statement as a demonstrative with the Court's permission. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, here, Professor Cott, I'll read this for the record. Mr. Cooper said that across history and customs, marriage is fundamentally a pro-child institution between a man and a woman. Marriage aims to meet the child's need to be emotionally, morally, practically, and legally affiliated with the woman and man whose sexual union brought the child into the world. In your view, from a historical perspective, is that a correct and complete description of the purposes of marriage? No, I think it's a very partial description. And why is it only a partial description? Well, as I look at the history, I see very little evidence that state authorities considered marriage from the point of view of its pro-child, particularly its pro-biological child, advantages. It's not that those advantages were absent, not at all, but rather that the purpose of the state, as I began to say before, and 
the incentives given to marriage were much broader than this in, in the aim to create stable and enduring unions between couples and so that they would support one another, whether or not they had children, and that they would support the broad range of their dependents, uh, biological children, but others. In the longer history of the United States, what we now call blended families and often think of as a contemporary innovation, um, such families were extremely common in the past because of early death and remarriage. And uh, many, many families in the past that were maritally based included in them among their dependents um, stepchildren, nieces and nephews whose parents might be absent or, or dead, um, maiden aunts, unmarried sisters, aged parents, and the establishment of marital unions and the expectation that the head of household or in the 20th century as we move toward the later 20th century, both heads of household uh, would be responsible for these dependents uh, has been an extremely central, I would say, purpose of um, the state's incentivizing of the marriage institution. Does marriage today serve any purposes beyond the purposes that it served at the founding of our country? I think that uh, the purposes it serves today, one can find uh, roots of these uh, through the past, but, but the emphasis has shifted, I think, in which purposes are more salient and uh, which now have less emphasis. Um, yesterday, we, we talked um, about the history of uh, marriage as it related to slavery. And I would like to ask you some questions now going back to that general topic concerning whether uh, marriage laws in this country uh, have always given members of the population equal access to the institution of marriage. Um, have marriage laws always treated citizens and other members of the population equally and fairly in this country? Say they have not. Um, in addition to the restrictions on slaves marrying, uh, do other restrictions come to mind? Yes, and I think these are more directly relevant than the slave example, which I used simply to illustrate starkly how marriage is uh, being able to marry is a sign that one has the basic civil rights and ability to consent. But the, re the restrictions on marriage that have played through American history are one major way in which uh, I can show evidence that marriage rules have been used as a mode of governance. And that was, as I mentioned yesterday, in dynamic tension with the extent to which marriage, uh, a marriage once formed, is um, a zone of liberty for the partners within it. That, by the way, is the emphasis toward which I think modern marriage has gone. But on the restrictive uh, examples, there are several I could mention. And the most um, plentiful are restrictions that uh, as many as 41 states and territories had for significant periods of their history on marriage between a white person and a person of color. I, I use that phrase because while these laws originated in, in the colonies in the 17th century with bars on marriage between whites and so-called Negroes or mulattoes, there were also bars in some states as early as the 17th century on marriage between whites and Indians. And uh, these bars, nullifications, criminalizations, different states treated differently. Um, they, uh, these kinds of restrictions multiplied after the Civil War when emancipated slaves could now marry. And while the slavery regime had controlled these marriages to a great extent, there, there were laws in the antebellum era Nonetheless, after 1865, these laws multiplied across the country. And in California and other Western states where there was considerable in-migration of people from Asia, uh, there were 
many laws with strange descriptive categories, I say strange from our contemporary point of view, of Asian ethnic or so-called racial groups, including Malays, Mongolians, uh, Kanakas, uh, and of course Chinese and Japanese. The, the marriage laws of California and Oregon and uh, a number of other Western states prohibited marriages between whites and persons of those descriptions. Now, these laws, of course, did not prevent any particular white or any particular Asian person from marrying totally, but they did prevent uh, a white person who fell in love with an Asian from marrying that person. Uh, and uh, therefore, it was a limitation on partner. Uh, it was a limitation on choice. And I want to add that legislatures in passing these laws, of course, thought to hope to um, reduce the number of them, uh, of, of such relationships, uh, preventing the marriages. They wanted to reduce the number of such relationships since they could not end in marriage. Let me, let me but, ask you, stop here then yeah. and ask you about that. How did legislators and others who advocated these restrictions, how did they justify their fairness and legitimacy um, in enacting them? I, I'll answer that, but if I could just finish my previous sentence, please. Sure. Um, Your Honor. They, they <laughs> <laughs> well, it's handy to throw in a question now and again, Ms. Cox. So. I, I'm sorry, but I was uh, perhaps I was being too <laughs> long-winded. The point I wanted to make, really, is that legislators knew these relationships were occurring. They simply did not want to give them the imprimatur of valid marriage. They wanted to make these relationships a second-class sort of relationship, a disfavored sort of relationship, and mark them that way by not giving them the full name and benefits of marriage. And given that, how did they at the same time justify them to the people of the United States as necessary and legitimate laws and restrictions? Well, they were usually justified as um, only natural, that these laws were fulfilling God's plan, that the races not mix that these were obvious and um, how could anyone object. They were highly defended as absolutely within uh, nature's and God's plan that certain marriages were right and other marriages were obviously not right. And the legislators, uh, while they were, of course, enacting the changes themselves, were citing, were rhetorically citing um, larger and higher reasons for their existence. Your Honor, I would like to publish one, one more uh, statement from Mr. Cooper's opening, which I'm calling Proposis Proponent's Position Number 4, with the Court's permission. Very well. Thank you. So Professor Cott, in, in his opening statement, Mr. Cooper declared that racial restrictions were never a definitional feature of the institutional institution of marriage. In your expert view as a as a historian, is that state, does that statement accurately reflect our history? No, I think it's inaccurate. Now, these um, restrictions, the, the, the racial restrictions, um, as you mentioned, were not limited to black and white citizens. I think you mentioned Asians. Were there any particular restrictions that related Asian Americans and Chinese Americans or people from those those areas who had, were living here. Yes, this is a complicated history. I'll try to be brief. Um, th there were a series of laws passed by Congress uh, from the 1880s on to exclude Chinese uh, laborers from entering the United States. Uh, laborers were the great bulk of those who wanted to immigrate. Uh, however, at the time the exclusion laws were passed, there were uh, about at least 100,000 or more uh, Chinese men resident in the United States who stayed. And uh, there was the question of how they could find marriage partners, since there were very, very few Chinese women. Uh, and as I said, around the same time, uh, many Western states, where most of these men lived, passed laws preventing Chinese from marrying whites. Uh, now. There, that, that would seem to destine these Chinese men to bachelorhood, which many of them stayed in. Uh, however, of course, there were states where um, uh, there were no Asian white restrictions. 
However, added to that, in 1907, as part of an immigration law, the federal government made a, a statement, which became law, that American women, native-born American citizens, upon marrying foreign men, or aliens, in the language of immigration law, upon marrying aliens, would lose their own American citizenship. I have to go into this, but this is another kind of restriction in placed through marriage policy, in this case, not law, because, of course, only the states really have the power to pass laws of marriage. But this federal policy said that any American woman who married a foreigner would have to take his citizenship and would lose her American citizenship, even if she was descended from the Mayflower. Now, that was bad enough, but uh, in the case of a woman marrying a German, let's say, if he wanted to become an American citizen, he could. He could go through the naturalization process. He could become an American citizen, and she could, as his spouse, also become an American citizen. He was no longer an alien. But Chinese were regarded as aliens ineligible to citizenship. That is, not only did the U.S. exclude Chinese and later Japanese and many other Asians, but they prevented those here from ever becoming citizens by naturalization. And was that a label that the phrase you just used, a label that was actually used, aliens ineligible for citizenship? Yes, I believe, in fact, that the state of California invented that phrase in order to designate those who could not own property in California without naming them racially. It was a, a way to designate exactly which group was meant without a specifically racial designation. And uh, let, so if I can just finish that train of thought. So an American woman who married a Chinese man would not only lose her American citizenship, but would never be able to regain it unless uh, he died, or I think if she divorced him, she could apply for naturalization. Now, though that, uh, what seems in retrospect amazing restriction on American women's citizenship rights because of who they married, was actually very uh, strongly fought in the 1920s once uh, women got the right to vote. And it was lifted by a um, federal act, it was changed, in the 20s, except that the um, particular uh, extra punishment for American women who married aliens ineligible to citizenship remained. And it was partially lifted for a very small group in the late 30s, but not really entirely lifted until the US became an ally of China in World War II and the uh, seemliness of the U.S. great restrictions on Chinese citizenship and naturalization came to seem not very, um, n not very smart in terms of international alliances and relationships. As a historical matter, marriage, the institution of marriage has generally been, been regulated by states. That is right. Um, and so was it unusual for the federal government to weigh in on marriage the way it did in, in, regarding um, Chinese and Asians in, in the acts you describe? Well, of course, the federal government has the power over immigration and naturalization and matters of national citizenship. And in, in setting this policy into the 1907 uh, Immigration Act, it, it seems to me this is one of these cases where uh, the federal government wasn't uh, really very circumspect in looking at how this would have an impact on people, and really whether it had the, po the power to do so, because the law rendered numbers of women stateless. The United States government had no power to say, well, this woman is married to a Russian. A, uh, a, uh, after the Bolshevik Revolution, the USSR did not follow the policy that an American, that a woman would take her husband's citizenship. So a woman who married somebody from the USSR in 1919 would be stateless. She would have lost her American citizenship and she would not have gained citizenship in the Soviet Union. And there were all sorts of anomalies as a result. And it was, I'm, I think I can say in retrospect, it was an extremely misguided policy in many ways, but it was an expression of policy that had tremendous impact on marriage. Are you aware of any more recent examples in our history where the federal government has um, inserted itself into marriage relationships in this country? Yes. 
Could you give me an example? I think the, ma the major area where this has been the case is with respect to channeling benefits to Americans through the institution of marriage. And a, a very great move in this direction was taken, of course, in the New Deal when in the 30s uh, the whole question of citizenship was amplified um, and uh, matters of social uh, social sufficiency, economic sufficiency were seen as part of citizenship, not only the political right to vote. And so in the major benefits that were uh, designed and implemented through the Social Security Act, for instance, uh, there was a marital advantage built in, a very distinct marital advantage for those who were in married couples as compared to either single individuals or unmarried couples. And since then, in, with the expansion of federal policies, uh, et cetera, in the 20th century, the federal government has tended to use the institution of marriage and the marriage-based family as the conduit for benefits uh, of many sorts. Do you, as a historian, see any parallels between the restrictions relating to race in our history in the institution of marriage and the restrictions that now exist in California concerning individuals of the same gender who wish to marry the person of their choosing? Yes, I do see parallels. Could you explain to me as a historical matter what parallels you see? I think that the most direct parallel is that the racially restrictive laws uh, prevented individuals from having complete choice on whom they married in a way that designated some groups as less uh, worthy than other groups and some marriages as less worthy than other marriages. And it uh, is part of the same effort, the same direction. It, it meant that the informal unions between couples who made that choice uh, would, would have less honor, less status, fewer benefits, and so on. Now, at some point, the racial restrictions and the limits on marrying persons across color lines were uh, abolished, correct? Yes. And, and um, when, when that happened, um, were alarms sounded? in the populace regarding what might happen to the institution of marriage? Yes. These, uh, shall Can I you describe go on? How, how people reacted and the kind of arguments that were made up at the time? Yes, of, of course, these were state laws and the shifts and change in them, both the passage of them and the removal of them, uh, there, there were a lot of cycles there. there was a big burst of these laws being passed in 1913, for instance, uh, even though one might think they were being seen to be uh, overly restrictive. They, they recurred through American history. And in fact, it's quite striking that even though the US Supreme Court in 1923 first named the right to marry as a fundamental right, the very next year, 1924, Virginia passed the most restrictive law in the nation uh, uh, about whites and blacks marrying. Now, there's always been, uh, just by the same token that these laws were defended as um, naturally based and God's uh, plan just being put into positive law, the efforts to undo them met I extreme alarm among those who thought these laws were correct. And uh, while the question of the constitutionality of these laws could have come before the U.S. Supreme Court earlier than the Supreme Court did decide on that question. Because this was thought to be such a um, hot button issue and be such a matter of controversy, the U.S. Supreme Court um, uh, approached it extremely uh, cautiously and did not take a case, although they could have taken a case in 1955, which would have brought this issue before the nation. They waited until 
not the case that was decided in 1967, uh, which came from Virginia and from that extremely restrictive law passed in 1924. Uh, so yes, there have all along that history was an, the subject was extremely controversial, and the people who supported such laws s saw these as very important definitional features of who could and should marry and who could not and should not. Did proponents of those laws argue that the abolition of them would uh, ruin the institution of marriage? Sir, I don't know whether the word ruin was used, but certainly they assumed that should couples across the color line be admitted to marriage, that the institution would be degraded, that their own marriages would somehow be devalued. And in, in as a historical matter, in your view, were they correct or incorrect in those assumptions? I think they were incorrect. Why is that? Well, there's been no evidence that the institution of marriage has become less popular because, or less valued by people or by the state, even though couples uh, needn't, uh, white people can marry whoever they want. Uh, so that uh, doesn't seem to me um, have to have been borne out in the history. And I might also mention that even to date, the proportion of marriages that are across the color line in the United States remains rather small. It tripled in its percentage between, I think in the 1960s, it was about 2% of marriages were across the color line. And by the end of the 20th century, about 6% of marriages were across the color line. Now, while that is a tripling of those marriages, it's also still a very, very small proportion of those marriages. And that's worth observing in terms of the alarm about how the change would affect the institution. Professor Cott, have marriage laws in the United States ever involved the, the state, the government, dictating the roles of spouses? Yes, indeed. Could you tell me, was there a, is there a term for uh, that role that the state played? Well, marriage traditionally in the United States um, uh, came from the common law, and the common law uh, uh, included a doctrine that was called coverture that described what marital roles and duties um, were. Why was it called coverture? Well, this is a word from the Norman French, uh, but it has to do with the fact that upon marriage, the wife was covered, in effect, by her husband's legal and economic identity. And she, uh, she lost her independent legal and economic individuality, certainly not her personality. We know that from literature. But she lost her legal and economic individuality, which is really why Jane Doe became Mrs. John Smith. She no longer had her legal individuality as Jane Doe. How, how did society and the states justify uh, that doctrine that took away a woman's individuality and individual status, in essence, um, once they became married? Well, this was the marital bargain to which both spouses consented. And it was a reciprocal bargain in which the husband had certain very important and uh, very important obligations that were enforced by the state. His obligation was to support his wife, provide her with the basic material goods of life, and to do so for their dependents. And her part of the bargain was to serve and obey him and lend to him all of her property and uh, also uh, enable him to take all of her earnings and represent her in court or in any sort of legal or economic um, transaction. And this was a highly asymmetrical bargain that to us today appears to enforce inequality. And I think that judgment isn't unwarranted but I do want to stress that it was not simply um, domination and submission. It was a mutual bargain, a reciprocal bargain, joined by consent. And it was the state, the common law, and then the positive law that adopted the common law that enforced those terms for the consensual bargain. The couple had to freely consent to it, but the state set the terms.
Was it viewed as, based on assumptions at the time, as sort of a natural division of labor between a man and a woman? This um, asymmetricality had everything to do with the sexual division of labor because assumptions were at the time that men were suited to be providers, were suited for certain sorts of work, whereas women, the weaker sex, were suited to be dependent, needed a stronger hand to guide them, support them, and protect them. Women's work in the household was also extremely important, and the kinds of work that women did and were willing to do were kinds of work that men would not do, like gardening and milking the cows. This was all very socially conventional. In other cultures, the sexual division of labor might be quite different in terms of what was assigned to which sex, but the sexual division of labor underlay the formation of the marital household and the reason that uh, a man and a woman were seen to be necessary to form a marital household so that their complementary um, tasks and duties and talents would be put in sync and would, would enable the household to survive. So did the difference in sexes of marital couples um, have uh, a connection to and, and, and explain, at least in part, um, what did it, let me, let me strike that and reframe it. Um, did the sexual division of labor, you know, it, does it explain in any manner um, the, the sexual differences in, in marital couples that um, we've seen through most of our history? I think, yes. And could you just elaborate on that briefly? Well, I think that with, at, a, at a time period, which extended over a very long period of time and really until um, the 20th century, when the sexes were seen as so unsuited to the same type of work and their, uh, the work of each sex was seen as so particular to uh, the work of men uh, on the one hand, the work of women on the other, yet both really were seen as uh, crucial to human survival and particularly to household uh, sufficiency and, and flourishing that this was an extremely important reason from the state's point of view to, um, to credit and, and create incentives for the formation of marital households where the population could live and be cared for. At some point in our history, did though the sexual uh, division of roles of spouses come to an end? Well, in the law, not fully until the 1970s, but that was catching up, I think, with an overall change in the economy and society toward, this is with the development of industrialization, move away from an agrarian society and toward a society in which work is mechanized, takes place in factories and shops and so on, uh, that with the direction of social and economic change, as well as change in values about uh, what is appropriate for each of the two sexes to do, uh, the, the sexual division of labor became far less rigid. And this was certainly beginning by the late 19th century, but through the 20th century and into our era, as um, the sexual division of labor is um, no longer necessary for the kinds of work people do in the world and uh, particularly after the um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, the assignment of spousal roles on the basis of very different proprieties for the sexual division of labor came to seem increasingly archaic. So that in, uh, in the law in the 1970s as part of the more widespread women's rights revolution, the states, uh, really by, um, by Supreme Court decisions, had to step out of this assignment of spousal roles by gender. And uh, this did not, however, in any way reduce the spouse's economic responsibility for one another and their bargain to support one another, which had always been reciprocal, though asymmetrical. So that currently, spousal roles are gender neutral in terms of the state's um, uh, assignment of them, that both spouses are obligated to support one another, but they are not obligated to do one another with a specific um, emphasis on one spouse being the provider and the other 
being the dependent. I believe, in your, as an expert, that that um, move towards gender neutrality in spousal relationships um, is, is relevant in terms of the historical development of marriage as it relates to m the marriage between individuals of the same gender. It does seem to me quite relevant, yes. Why is it relevant? Well, in the many years when the sexual division of labor and this assumption that the marital couple was a, an asymmetrical couple with a provider and a dependent, um, that was quite consistent with uh, marriage between a man and a woman. However, the more re uh, symmetrical and gender neutral spousal roles have become, in fact, I would say, in the social world and certainly in the law, the more that the marriage between couples of the same sex seems perfectly capable of fulfilling the um, purposes of marriage. And um, as it stands today, individual couples are certainly free to have gender asymmetrical roles if they prefer, but that's merely a matter of personal decision. It's not something the state prescribes. The coverture doctrine is dead. Uh, it, it's, it's something up to intimate decision making and the presence in marriage, in valid marriage of a couple of the same sex fulfills all of the historical purposes of marriage that continue into the present day. When these changes in gender equality within the marital relationship uh, occurred and began to occur, were there uh, people in society who said that that would have a negative impact on the institution of marriage in this country? Most definitely. Well, could you, could you uh, give me an overview of the kind of objections and concerns that were expressed on those issues? Well, a century ago, or and throughout the entire 19th century, when this became a controversial issue as certain state laws were passed that um, edged into reducing the coverture doctrine in its entirety, um, tremendous alarms were raised because the primacy of the husband as the legal and economic representative of the couple and the protector and provider for his wife was seen as absolutely essential to what marriage was. That asymmetry was seen as absolutely essential. And while the initial ways of breaking into that, which were a series of laws that were passed to enable married women to have their own property and then their earnings. While these initial forays um, raised tremendous alarm, they were motivated really by uh, concern, economic concerns about families' economic stability. They were not in motivation on the part of the legislatures about uh, women's equality and individuality. In fact, there were lots of assumptions that the model of marriage, provider, dependent, and so on, with all of its implications about differing sex roles, um, that these would persist. But over time, and particularly as uh, the women's rights movement and the suffrage movement gained steam, and when women gained the vote, which was, of course, a very important move toward their legal individuality, the doctrine of coverture came to seem more and more archaic. It still, because there were such alarms about it and such resistance to change in this, what had been seen as quite an essential characteristic of marriage, it took a very, very long time before um, this trajectory of the removal of the state from prescribing these rigid spousal roles was completed. And uh, it, in, in fact, there are instances I could cite, which I won't, of how it recurred in certain decisions and policies in the early 20th century. However, I think I'm fairly confident in saying that because of the Supreme Court decisions in the 1970s, that in terms of the law, that this quality of marriage is, um, you know, has, has been removed to, to no apparent damage to the institution. Uh, and in fact, I think to the benefit of the institution and, but. Let, let me ask you uh, in terms of historical trends in changes to the institution of marriage, um, uh, do you see 
such trends? Have there, has there been a trend, trend or a trajectory as marriage has developed and the laws have changed? Well, this is never a straight line. I do think there has been a, an overall direction of change in the way marriage has been defined and understood and um, uh, uh, regulated through the states. And that is toward uh, a greater symmetrical understanding of the two partners' roles in the marriage, greater equality of those two partners, and um, fewer restrictions on the choice of marital partner. Therefore, the, the, the overall emphasis I mentioned earlier that certain of the emphases within the purposes of marriage had shifted in terms of their gravity over time, and I think the shift has been toward re-emphasizing the extent to which marriage choice and the zone of privacy and intimacy and familial um, harmony that marriage ideally should create has, has been the emphasis on that as a zone of liberty that it should be available to citizens has been more greatly emphasized, whereas the aspect of marriage as an, a regulatory and governing institution uh, ha, that in, in which the state is uh, more prescriptive about who should and shouldn't marry and what should go on in a marriage, that, that the direction has been away from governance and toward liberty, although both characters s still typify the marriage institution as a whole. You have a view, based on your historical research and study, uh, as to how those trends bear on the issue of whether individuals of the same gender uh, should have the right to marry. It does seem to me that th that direction of change leads consistently toward, uh, toward the appropriateness of allowing same-sex couples to marry. Why is that? Because uh, if gender symmetry and equality and uh, the couple's own definition of spousal roles are characteristic of marriage, then same-sex couples seem perfectly able to fulfill those roles. There's no longer an expectation that the man-woman difference need found a household given that the sexual division of labor is no longer so pronounced in our society and isn't, uh, I hope, a founding <laughs> feature of our economy and how economic benefit is created. And in, in all those respects, including the respect in which, uh, importantly, I think, other restrictions on choice of marital partner other um, restrictions that seem to have a constitutional um, question aroused in them, like race, um, these have been removed. Of course, the state retains its right to restrict access to marriage and still does in many other ways, which are not controversial. You were aware, and I want you to assume that the proponents, um, witness or witnesses, have suggested that if the state authorizes um, individuals of the same sex to marry, that will damage the institution of marriage and perhaps cause, well, you were aware of that, correct? I am. Um, are you, as, as a historian, based on your study in your book and in informing your opinions here, um, do you, aware of any basis, empirical basis, um, to, to conclude that authorizing individuals of the same gender to marry would uh, increase the divorce rate? No. And are, are you aware of any evidence that uh, would refute that assertion? Uh, objection, Your Honor. It's not only leading, but uh, the witness was asked during her deposition whether she was an expert in the consequences of same-sex marriage. And she said, that seems to me an impossible question to answer. And so now she's being asked the question she refused to answer during her deposition, and which is not in her report in any meaningful way. Your Honor, may I? Oh, I'm Mr. Bertrish. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Your Honor. Um, it is in her report on page 5 of her rebuttal report, and on page 199 of her deposition, Mr. Thompson examined her on 
the uh, issue of divorce in uh, in her home state. Page five. Uh, page five of her rebuttal report. But not in the deposition. Uh, but it is in the, in the deposition on page 199. She was questioned about that as well. She begins on 198 and then carries over. It does appear this subject was uh, explored at least to some degree in the deposition. Uh, let me. Uh, to hear the testimony, and then, if necessary, you can review, you can renew the uh, objection by way of a motion to strike. Thank you, Your Honor. Could you re rephrase? Yes. The question, Are you please? aware of any evidence, uh, empirical evidence, that uh, bears on the issue of whether uh, a, a law allowing individuals of, of the same gender to marry would affect the divorce rate? My only comment can come from observation of my home state of Massachusetts, which has had same-sex marriage for, I think, five years now. And this is, of course, only a correlation, but uh, Massachusetts has the lowest divorce rate in the nation. And, and it, has it increased since uh, marriage between individuals of the same sex has been recognized? No, it has fluctuated, but around a tenth of a percentage point, but if anything, the direction has been down rather than up. Thank you. To go back to something you mentioned a moment ago, what do you today, based on the collection of events that make up our history as a nation, view as the key defining characteristics of the institution of marriage in the United States? First, of course, the, the consent of the two parties, which has been the basis for a marriage since the era of the common law, the free consent of the two parties. And I'll just add that in, in the United States, as compared to Europe for centuries, that consent has been presumed to rest on a love match, not on an arranged marriage. So mutual consent uh, between partners who freely choose each other and their commitment to establish a continuing stable relationship as the foundation for a household in which they will economically support one another and their dependents and enable themselves to compose a family. Do you believe that uh, a law recognizing and the ability of individuals of the same sex to marry would be consistent and would, would uh, include those characteristics you have just identified as being defining? Yes. Why? It seems to me that couples of the same sex have expressed many of the same motivations as couples of different sex to marry and to establish stable households. And uh, in that regard, uh, especially in an era when um, families um, can have children that are not the result of biological procreation, and so many families do, that it seems to me same-sex couples fulfill the aims of marriage from the point of view of the state, and certainly it's up to any uh, partner, uh, intimate pair to decide whether they wish to be married or not, but uh, it seems to me that by excluding same-sex couples from the ability to marry and engage in this highly valued institution that um, society is actually denying itself another, uh, another resource for stability and social order. <laughs> 
Ron, if I may just check with my colleagues, I, I think I may have covered the waterfront. Very well. No further questions, Your Honor. Well, Mr. Thompson, you may cross-examine. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we, we have some binders. May we approach uh, the court and the witness and pass out the binders? Certainly. You Thank you, Your Honor. Yourself. 